If you're new to this channel, you may consider subscribing and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. Please share it with all others who might benefit. Let's get started. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about the importance of batch normalization in neural networks. So let's try to decode these terms one by one. And by the end of this tutorial, you'll have complete clarity as to what is the importance of batch normalization and how does it help with regularization in neural networks. Let's understand that. So first of all, we have some data. We want to train our neural network on that data. Eventually, when we pass the data, we are generating predictions. And when we have the predictions with us, we want to calculate some loss, which will be proportional to the difference of the actual value y and the predicted value y hat. Now, once the loss is calculated, we go about updating the weights and biases. Now, the question is, at what stage should the neural network calculate the loss and update the weights and biases? Let's say we started with 10,000 records. Should we calculate the loss for every single record and update the weights and biases accordingly? Or should we pass the entire data like 10,000 records and at the end of it, we should calculate the overall loss and accordingly update the weights and biases? So apparently both these approaches of passing every single record one at a time and updating the weights and biases, as well as passing the entire data and then updating the weights and biases prove out to be extremes, which are not very favorable. What people resorted to instead is that we divide the entire data into certain number of batches. So let's say we had 10,000 records. We divide them into 10 batches of 1,000 records each. Now we'll be updating our weights and biases after each batch is exposed to the network, which means we run the first batch, let's say 1,000 randomly selected records from the overall data. We calculate the loss for these 1,000 records and update our weights and biases. Then we take another randomly selected batch and please note there would be no overlap between these batches. So a record that gets selected for a given batch would remain with that batch. When you select the second batch, it would have no overlap with the first batch. That's how you do it. And when we complete this entire pass, that is we pass all 10,000 records in the form of these 10 batches, that's called one epoch. If you choose multiple epochs, you will once again form batches, again randomly selecting 10 batches with 1,000 records each. So this process of training is done in the form of batches. Our batch normalization definitely borrows the word batch from here. We are dealing with a large data which has been divided into batches and that's being passed to a network. Now how many batches we choose is again a hyperparameter that is something that we can try and experiment with. But this is for example, I mentioned that let's say we divided our entire data into 10 batches. So important terms are batches and epochs. Epoch is when the entire data is passed through the network. You run another epoch, you once again come to the 10,000 records as base and randomly start selecting your batches. Within an epoch, the batches will not have an overlap. That's another important point. So we understand the term batch very well. Now let's decode the term normalization. Let's say we have a neural network. It's a very simple neural network. And we have two features, x1 and x2. What is a better state to be in? Let's look at the scenario one. So if you see x1 and x2 are pretty concentrated here, they have similar kind of spread on the x1 and x2 axes. And it's an even scenario. You can say there is a very even distribution of x1 and x2 here. This is one scenario. You can give your inputs like this. The other scenario is, let's say x1 remains the same, but x2 varies a lot more now. So which is a better scenario? How should we pass the data? Should we ensure that while passing the data to a neural network, our features are on compatible scales? Or should we even go for uneven scales? Well, it turns out that if we choose to work with uneven scales, we end up running into several problems. See, eventually in a neural network, we want to establish a connection between the loss and how does the loss get affected by changing the weights, weights associated with features. Now, the problem is if we have features occupying different scales, the gradients that we calculate here will also be uneven. And this causes the neural network to take a lot of time to converge to achieve the minimum loss scenario. That's a big drawback. At times, that even leads to exploding or vanishing gradients because a feature which has a high magnitude tends to have gradients that vary a lot compared to a feature which is concentrated. So overall in neural networks, it's a common practice to have the inputs normalized. That's a given. Now, we may start with normalized inputs here at the input layer. 
But there's a lot more that happens beyond this layer. Because when we go to the stage of hidden layer, we are aggregating several weighted sum of inputs. So it may no longer remain in that scaled range. If we start with 100 features and all the features are normalized, you can imagine when you do a sum of all those 100 inputs here, it may not be in the same range as you started with. So once again, what we resolved for the input layer may no longer be applicable for the hidden layers. And so would be the case here, let's say. When we are aggregating it based on the activation function, the aggregation may not necessarily follow the same kind of distribution. That is where the batch normalization comes. So batch normalization talks about normalizations at the hidden layer stages, where we can do normalization before the activation or after the activation. But the whole idea is to maintain the inputs to the subsequent layers centered and not uneven like this. That's the motivation behind batch normalization. Now let's understand what are the steps involved in batch normalization. First step is to calculate the mean and variance for each batch. Notice in terms of a representation, we have used the symbol Z instead of X. Why? Because we are talking about the hidden layers. X generally represents the inputs. So we kind of, to segregate it, have given you a different notation. That we are doing aggregations at different stages and we are trying to calculate the average of those values. Similarly, we are doing calculation of the variance. Square root of this variance, you can imagine, would be the standard deviation. So in order to normalize, we'll have to first have the mean and the variance available. Now the step two would be normalization, which is zi minus the average for the batch, which we've computed here, divided by the standard deviation, where m here represents the number of observations in a batch. It's like the division by the counts for each batch that we are doing. And this epsilon here that we add is basically a smoothing parameter, which ensures that if we have the variance as zero, we don't run into an error. Zero division is a problem, we know that. So there's a very small numerical value that we want to add to ensure that if we run into a situation of zero variance, we don't end up dividing by zero because that leads to errors. Now, step three is that we scale and shift as needed. Now, this is a very important point. Why do we need scale and shift? And this has two parameters which are learned. So batch normalization, you will witness that it comes with its own set of parameters as well. It has four parameters. Two of these are gamma and beta. This gamma is known as the scaling parameter and this beta is known as the shift parameter. Let me show you an example as to how these work. So we are looking at a scenario where we have normal distributions, let's say centered around zero and a standard deviation of one. Actually, right now we have two curves, but you're able to see only one because this one, the darker one is kind of overlapping the one which is lighter, it's in the background. But we have introduced these sliders here to be able to see how changing gamma and beta affects the distributions. One is a static distribution, other is a dynamic one. For the dynamic one, we can try to alter the value of beta first, right? So let's say we shift beta and try to increase this. You will see the two curves are now getting separated. As I change the value of beta, you can see the distribution kind of shifts to the right. And similarly, if I reduce the value of beta, you can again see the distribution kind of changes. So this is representing the parameter for position. The shape remains intact, but the position of the distribution changes. Let's bring it back to zero and now try to change just the gamma. So gamma is the scaling parameter. And if we try to reduce this, let's see what happens. Do you observe that this dynamic distribution kind of shrunk a little bit? So for a given value of x, if we pick it up from the x-axis, the value that this distribution, the dynamic distribution attains on the y-axis is less compared to the original normal distribution because we chose a value of gamma which was less than one. If we choose a value of gamma less than one, then the values attained by the distribution will shrink or reduce. On the other hand, if we choose a value of gamma which is greater than one, let's say I try to change it to 1.1, you can imagine it completely overlaps the original distribution. Why? Because it is now attaining bigger values for a given x compared to the original distribution. So while working on the data, if in the process our distributions get shifted a little bit, we can use gamma and beta to align them to the standard normal form. That's the whole idea of using gamma and beta. I hope you get this clarity through this small illustration. Now coming back to the slides, the step four now is that we need to keep track of the mean and variance for the inference stage. 
This is when you get a new record or a test record. What happens is you get a new record, but what is the mean and standard deviation that you're going to use to scale it? It's just one record, right? So you need to get some representation of mean and standard deviation, which you can utilize to scale the new record. So in order to scale that, we use exponentially weighted moving average EMAs as we call it, which is obtained from the training data and parked aside. We use it only when we get the new records. So how many parameters are involved in batch normalization? There are four parameters involved in batch normalization in total. So first two are gamma and beta. Gamma is used for scaling and beta is used for position. Then we also have these calculated mean and variances from the population. These two parameters are learnable. This mean and variance here would be computed. Now let's understand why do we say batch normalization also is a regularization technique. So the answer lies in the way we form these batches. Let's say there is a given record and it was participating in batch one. We would have scaled it using the mean and standard deviation of that entire batch. In a particular epoch, that will get scaled in a certain way with the help of the mean and standard deviation of that entire batch. But in the second epoch, when we again form the batches, randomly sampling the data, this record may not have the same records accompanying it which means you may have another 999 records. Some could be common, some could be different. As a result, your mean and standard deviation is going to be different. And if the mean and standard deviation is going to be different, it will be scaled in a different way. So what happens is, in a way, we are not letting this record being given to the network in one and the same form as we did earlier. And this introduces regularization. This is a very important aspect to understand how batch normalization attains regularization. Hope this helps.